the uh, genealogist for the Duval Family Association, and uh, I think we are very honored to have with us today Dr. James Denham. Mike and his friends know him, and you all probably, a lot of you, know him better than I. <laughs> I'm so glad everybody could make it. Uh, where are some of you from? The this group. Here? I will. I will identify my my pals. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, Everybody's now hands up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> He's professor of history and director of the Lawton M. Childs Jr. Center for Florida History at the Florida Southern University in Lakeland, Florida. Uh, before going there in 1991, Mike held teaching appointments at Florida State University, Georgia Southern University, and Limestone College in South Carolina. He's a specialist in Southern Florida and criminal justice and legal history. Dr. Denham received his PhD degree from Florida State University in 1988. He is author of many books, but uh, I'll mention here A Rogue's Paradise, Crime and Punishment in Antebellum, Florida from 1821 to 61, 50 Years of Justice, A History of the U.S. District Court for the Middle District of Florida, and but not last, the reason why we're here, Florida founder William P. Duvall, Frontier Bon Vivant. Um, I can go on and on, but an extensive list of publications and uh, I won't bore you about those, but he is well published, <laughs> well acknowledged, and I present to you a Mike Denham. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here uh, with you on this special day. This is, I think, the first, the first time the Duval Society has been to Tallahassee for an official event. Um, I'm looking forward to being with you the next day and a half and going through a lot of the wonderful sites that I got to know as a graduate student here for longer than I can tell you uh, at Florida State University. Um, and I want to introduce some special friends that, that I've known many, many years who've been with me in this project from start to finish. Um, first of all, my dear friend Larry Rivers, uh, the preeminent uh, historian of slavery in Florida and also uh, in the South, I might add. And again, it was- I paid you well. And remember, <laughs> it, was, remember it, was, it was Southern, and Florida history, not Southern Florida history. But there was a common there. Not okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Professor Rivers. Uh, also, my 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 friend Bert Altman uh, with the red shirt. He uh, uh, was at Florida State for many many years when I was in grad school, and we've known each other for many years. And he's an expert on the Cascades, which I believe we're going to be visiting this afternoon. And he all, often leads tours out there. But he's going to be with us for a special Duval. Uh, part of the Cascades tour. And Joe Kinnett, who's my dear friend oh, yeah. from grad school, who knows more about Florida land issues that Duval was involved in, and of course uh, uh, all these other folks that are connected to the Duvals, like the, like the, uh, like the um, Randolph family, who um, married into the Duval family. And again, the San, uh, San Luis is that, uh, that location of that plantation. Uh, anyway, Joe, Joe and I actually, um, <coughs> about five or six years ago, maybe more the years go by very quickly, yeah. um, we, we actually went out to the Cascade area and were able to kind of trace out what we thought were the perimeter of the first uh, Duval homestead there. And we're gonna actually see some of that today. And uh, with the yellow shirt is the preeminent uh, journalist of the, the Tallahassee Democrat, Gerald Ensley who um, I always admired when I was in grad school. He, he wrote with an Englishman's, uh, England is major's flair. He would always put in Shakespeare and all kinds of other Bob Dylan references <laughs> and, and, and all kinds of other cool things in his journalism. And I'm very honored that he's with us today. I really, really am. Um, and also Bob Holliday, who, is, who teaches at Tallahassee Community College and also writes a column for the, for the Democrat and is increasingly being recognized as the preeminent local historian, I think, of, uh, uh, of, um, of Tallahassee. Anyway. Are you nuts? Without all <laughs> <laughs> Well, without further ado, though, I want to welcome all my new friends at Duval Society and um, tell you a little bit about uh, the guy that I've spent 23 years with, um, and that's this guy right here, uh, William Pope Duval. Many of you know his early origins, and I write about those in the book. He was actually born in Richmond, Virginia, really with a silver spoon in his mouth, I'd say. 
His father was mayor of Richmond, either then or maybe about the time. He was born one year after the American Revolution. If you put all this kind of this time frame in context, that's very important. One year after the American Revolution, 1784. Okay. So he was a little boy when the revolution ended. His father was a major, his father had known Washington. His father got all of this land, but he got it all on paper. He didn't get it really, you know, he had to go out there and basically, or he had to have somebody go out there. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of acres of land because he was an officer in the revolution and that's basically how the revolutionary office, officers were paid is in land warrants. So this little boy grows up in this household and is one of the largest, um, one of the most distinguished houses in Richmond on Chaco Hill. Everybody knows Chaco <coughs> Hill. Uh, all of those, that resi that was a residential area at one time. And right across the street from, from uh, Major Duval's house was Chancellor Wyss House, who was the preeminent legal scholar of America, who was the teacher of Thomas Jefferson, and the teacher of Major Duval, and the teacher of Henry Clay, um, you know, is, is this beginning to, to ring a bell? So anyway, um, so Major Duval had connections, which means that this young kid who was a pretty precocious kid um, would be able to use these connections later on. So basically what happened is about 1800, this kid and his older brother, this kid's about 14, his older brother's about 20, they set out to get these land warrants in Kentucky patented. So they go across the, you want to hit the, the slide there for me? Uh, they, they go across into the, on the Cumberland Road, uh, or the uh, Wilderness Road, as it's often called, from the uh, Martinsburg, Virginia area. She, uh, well, they actually uh, go from Richmond. So they catch the road around here and then they go to the brand new Kentucky settlement. So this is about um, 15 years after the American Revolution. Okay. And Kentucky is really where all the Virginians are going to, to seek their fortune. So this 15-year-old kid and his older brother go out there, and the older brother uh, takes all this money that they basically saved, and his father kind of set them up. And the idea is for them to go both go out there and patent these lands. Well, the, the older brother ends up basically drinking and gambling away all this, all these, all the money, <laughs> taking the wagon and the mules and the whatever else they've got, and squanders it away, and then dies. <laughs> and so it's kind of a fiasco. And uh, that's all in the beginning of the book, and I don't want to get too much in detail on that. But anyway, they have lots of, lots of relatives out there already. In fact, their what relative is the governor of Kentucky. So do you think they have some connections? You bet they have connections. But anyway, so, so Duval is a young man. He's 14, 15, 16 years old. His brother's gone. He just stays out there. And he starts, he uses his father's connections. He starts reading law in the law office of this uh, gentleman who's connected to his father. He, he reads law and he, mar and he meets this beautiful, supposedly the beautiful, most beautiful and the r richest girl in town. Um, and that's Nancy Hines. And they marry, and he's in this boisterous frontier in the Bardstown area. Now, Bardstown was an amazingly um, active place for lawyers. And in Kentucky, the way to make money was to be a lawyer. Why? You probably know all this. Um, Henry Clay is a good example. Henry Clay, by the way, Duval's mortal enemy. Nobody knows exactly why, but they were on the, uh, on the opposite ends of things. Henry Clay is a little older than Duval. But, um, lawyers and land. Nobody has clear titles to any land in, in Kentucky. So it's a lawyer's paradise because they're constantly in court, um, you know, trying to prove land or whatever. The, the legal fees always outstrip the price of the land or the value of the land. Anyway, so Duval's mixed up in all of that. And he starts riding circuit and he gets a reputation as a tremendously bright, smart, articulate, fun loving guy. And he, like everybody else aspiring, he runs for Congress and he wins. And about that time, the War of 1812 breaks out. 
So he fights a campaign in the Illinois country, or in the Indiana country, here. And here's Louisville here, and of course, uh, there was a lot of campaigning after the War of 1812 broke out, and it's a fiasco. The whole thing's a fiasco. He's like a lieutenant or a major in a, in a, in a attack force that goes into Indiana, and you all know William Henry Harrison is in, up there, and a young captain um, who's going to eventually become pretty important, uh, a young captain by the name of Zachary Taylor Zachary. Is, is also up there, and Duval kind of meets him and so forth. And the entire, the entire campaign, which lasts about three months, is a fiasco. It's a disaster. The troops, of course, they can't find the Indians they're supposed to be going after. Uh, the Indians set the prairies on fire. Everything is just a disaster. And so they all have to come home. And Duval, but Duval, of course, is a military individual at this point. He also fights, by the way, incidentally, with his, with his brother-in-law, some of the Heinzes. Okay. So it comes back just in time to go to Washington for his first, his first uh, congressional session. So it goes all the way back through Kentucky into Washington, and during that uh, session, um, there's some interesting people there. Um, this was, of course, the congressional session that included John C. Calhoun, uh, Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House. Um, and lots and lots of other very, very important figures. And he served in Congress, went back to Kentucky, uh, finished, the, finished the session, went back to Kentucky. Another person that he met um, while he was there, um, actually the second time he went to session in Congress, this is what he found. This, of course, is the White House, um, and you can see it's not exactly burned all the way down, but it's, in, it's pretty much in ashes. Uh, Duval went back to Washington to find the, the capital devastated by the British um, in the attack on Washington. And so he was in that Congress and had to figure out, now what do we do now? Do we move the capital? Do we stay here? Do we whatever? There was already talk of, of among some northern, particularly northern leaders of seceding from the Union because the war had not gone very well for the, for the country. They opposed the war. The country was in a mess. But during that time, um, the next one, he met this guy. Anybody, anybody um, this was of course either this, this session or maybe the session before, he met this guy. Anybody knew who this guy is? Clay or Taylor? Any guesses? Washington Irving? Yes, this is Washington Irving. This is Washington Irving. Washington Irving was in Washington that session with his brother, who was a member of, also a member of Congress in New York. And this is where I think they first got to know each other. Washington Irving and another guy by the name of James Kirk Paulding. Now, Ensley's going to know that name because he's an English major. Uh, not many other people probably know, know uh, James Kirk Paulding. But very much like uh, Washington Irving, he was also another literary figure. And he wrote plays. He wrote uh, he wrote short stories, and his one of his characters in his short story is the Lion of the West. It's one of my favorite names in literary history. Nimrod Wildfire. Nimrod Wildfire. Now I think that Duval is the subject for a Nimrod Wildfire. I can't prove it, but I think that's the case. But more than that. And by the way, I think he was cousins or connected some way by marriage with Irving. But this is where Irving picked up all of Duval's stories. Um, I, left, I left Richmond in a huff with my father after an argument with my father. My father told me to go out and chop firewood, but I said, no, I'm not going. And I'm, furthermore, I'm leaving this, this house, and I'm not coming back to Virginia until I'm a member of Congress from Kentucky. This he did supposedly as a 15-year-old kid, right? Um, this is what this is what um, this is what Washington Irving wrote, among other things, about about Ralph Greenwood, who was this great Nimrod wildfire-like character who lived in the woods and and fought and hunted bears for his whole adolescence, and basically, you know, and all the all the tall tales. So anyway, this was the this was the meeting I think that that would create a relationship, an off and on relationship with, with Duval for the next 40 years, <clears throat> okay? 
Now this man would have a tremendous influence on Duval. In fact, you could even call him uh, a mentor. Now he was an up and coming congressman in uh, in um, uh, in in South the Carolina. Congress from South Carolina, John C. Calhoun. Many of you have seen pictures of John C. Calhoun. Right. He's very old. He's he looks he looks um, like he's got tuberculosis and he's got the big hair coming out like this and he's angry. Um, well, that's really the John C. Calhoun that we think of when we think of John C. Calhoun. This is the young, certain to be president, up and coming congressman. Many claim he is the smartest individual. Um, in Congress and is destined to be President of the United States. In fact, he would be everything but. He would end up being Secretary of War under James Monroe. He would end up being Andrew Jackson's Vice President. But of course, the states' rights issue began to cloud his career. And, and he became, very quickly, um, a mentor for Duval and would be key when Duval would go home. He only served one term in Congress. And when the great um, banking catastrophes in Kentucky occurred, about 1816, 1817, 1818, when Duval and everybody like him lost everything, they all went broke. It was, it was John C. Calhoun who threw out a lifeline to his friend Duval as Secretary of War in, in Monroe's administration and gave him a government job, or got him a government job. Now this is Washington about that time, maybe 1820s, 1830s. This is, of course, President James Monroe, once again of the Virginia dynasty. The connection here is so clear. Monroe knew Major Duval in Richmond. Washington knew Major Duval in Richmond. Madison knew Duval. The Madison, the Virginia dynasty is gonna come into play here. Monroe chose as his Secretary of War, John C. Calhoun who used his influence in 1820, 1821, when this new territory was acquired um, through the work of General Andrew Jackson, which we're gonna look at in a second, he was able to uh, get Duval a job. Okay. This, of course, is General Andrew Jackson at the time, roughly at the time of the Battle of New Orleans, and then later uh, in 1818, 1819, Jackson invaded Florida, Spanish Florida, on the pretext of Native Americans attacking Americans, uh, Americans in Georgia. But anyway, he came down right in here, uh, right through this area, and took, um, took uh, Florida. And eventually, within months, uh, uh, John Quincy Adams escalated uh, negotiations, and Florida became an American territory, and Florida was acquired from Spain. This is what the new territory looked like. Uh, in the very beginning, you can see yellow and, and, and pink here, um, <clears throat> and you can see the, the um, there's not many towns at all. We have basically St. Augustine, which is the old Spanish city on the Atlantic, and then Pensacola on the Gulf. And here is um, one of Jackson's cronies, and of course one of the things that we learn about in the very beginning of Florida during the territorial period is that Jackson's Aura, Jackson's influence on Florida was extremely significant. Jackson became the first, he's not really territorial governor, I think Duval was the first territorial governor. Jackson was more of a military official. In fact, when Jackson was the, received the transfer of flags in Pensacola, he was not really even considered a governor, he was considered more of a commissioner. He was only here three months, but he had an important legacy and he, his goal was to try to transfer to a lot of his lieutenants, including uh, James Guest and then the guy that's, whose house we're gonna go see today, um, and that's uh, Richard Keith Call. His goal was to provide for them important offices in the territory, and he did a pretty good job of it. Okay. So this is James Gadsden, and the reason I have his picture here is he would work with Duval very closely in the very beginning of the territory in their negotiations with the Indians. Okay. Now this is a picture, I know you can't see the, the writing, but this is actually a treaty, this is a signature of a treaty, um, of the Treaty of Moultrie Creek. Now Moultrie Creek was real close to St. Augustine, and this was a meeting which was actually presided over by 
the new governor, Duval, um, and Gadsden, and, and, and this is a signature, uh, the, there was a signature of the Indians who, by the way, were scattered throughout the territory, something like 5,000 of them. And, um, but they were brought together to sign this treaty to create this reservation um, in the heart of the, the peninsula. Now this looks really clean and, and efficient here, but it really shouldn't, you shouldn't be fooled by that. There were lots of other Indians, particularly here in the Panhandle, and particularly right where we are located right now. Uh, among those were, was a, were a band of Indians uh, under the command of a gentleman by the name of Nia Malta. Um, this is actually, if you go back up a little bit, up one, up one, up one, up one, up one. Nia Malta. Uh, Nia Malta was the very, very redoubtable, commanding, majestic figure who who commanded the Indians in this area. Now, Nehemaltha and Duval would have a kind of Washington Irving-esque confrontation, uh, which would be depicted later on in some of his, uh, some of his activities. Go back, go back. Okay, back. Oh, right here. Okay, now, okay. No, no, back, there. Um, the first legislature that Duval presided over was in St. Augustine. Um, and it was clear at that time, this is 1823, that we needed a more central location for the capital and territory. All we had was Pensacola and St. Augustine. So Duval arranged for two commissioners to discover and to find a midway point um, in, in the territory for a capital. There's no talk at all of anything below present day Gainesville. All of that is just, you know, got, you know, flooded out, you know, water. But this area particularly, where we are now, was identified way back by Jackson's forces and others who knew that this was one of the most fertile areas anywhere left that had not been settled yet in the 1820s in the American frontier. This area here, these five or six counties, as Larry's written about from, uh, extensively, called the Red Hills of Florida, was where everybody knew, even before any of the, any of the talk of the capital, this was the, this was the most fertile territory anywhere left in the American, in the, under the control of the Americans. Um, and so it's really kind of natural that, they, that these two commissioners, just by luck, right, <clears throat> end up coming here and find this location. And so this is the plan of the, uh, of, of the eventual city of Tallahassee. And uh, they sold city lots, and they were actually able to raise like $45,000, which is an immense sum of the time, incredibly large. And I love this uh, grid here because you can see here, um, there's a little box here. It says Governor Duval's residence. And it also has a little, um, has a little stream kind of coming from this direction. And it shows this little, this little place here, and that, of course, is the Cascade. And Bert, I know you've seen this picture a thousand times, and of course, it really gives you, you know, an obvious, obvious picture of what we see today when we go there. Um, so, so anyway, this was, and Duval, by the way, had a lot of experience in city planning. He had been city attorney of Bardstown. His father was mayor of Bardstown and his father had been involved in laying out a lot of the new sections of Richmond. In fact, if you go to Richmond today, there's a, there's a, a reference that some of the older residents know of Duval's addition um, in Richmond. So, so Duval had experience with, with laying out uh, city plans, and I, I can't help but think that he wasn't very involved in this. Now, who is this guy? Who is this guy? The military guy. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> he's not, you know, he's, uh, there are, it's estimated that more counties of states are named for him than any other, any other figure besides maybe Washington. There's a Washington County in Florida and almost every other county. Uh, but he's like number two in terms of the counties named for, for this guy of states. 
in this in this entire state of the state states. This is Marquis de Lafayette, <clears throat> and I like this picture because it's an it's a picture of his of, of, an, of an older man. He was practically a teenager, of course, when he fought in the American Revolution. Um, but he came back to, to America in 1824 for his grand, or maybe 1826, one of the very close, for a grand tour of America. The old Frenchman who was Washington's comrade, but more than that, he had all his troops, right? Um, who he brought over, he used the French, you know, all the French money and the French troops. Um, but we, he, he makes this grand tour. He goes from New England all the way down to the Middle States to Savannah. And everywhere he goes, he's wined and dined and fed it. Everybody turns out. But what he was really here for is what? Money. Money. He got to address Congress. Or at least I think that's so. But anyway, Congress gave him a whole township of land in commemoration for his service. And guess where they put that township of land? Yes, We're sitting right on it right now. Do you think this was a, a pretty good, um, a pretty good uh, advertisement for Florida um, in terms of, you know, hey, this is, this must be a cool place in Marquis de Lafayette. Okay, everywhere you go in Tallahassee today, we're going to drive by Mar uh, Lafayette this, Lafayette that. You've probably already seen a lot of Lafayette stuff everywhere. Anyway, there he is, and he never came to Florida. Yes, absolutely. Questions, please. Now, is this when he was a young man? Or no, no. No, he's an old man there. Yeah. Um, of course, he got older, I'm sure. I don't think I've ever seen him even draw in this thing. But he, uh, remember, this is this is 1824. I know that. And he would have been, he would have been, um, there's also a painting in Mount Vernon, which is of the same era. And yeah. We're all thinking of him as a young man, but that's it. Okay. Yeah, I think you'll love this. Painting Mount Vernon is also a young man. Mike, you'll love this. Mike, you'll love this story on this tour. He came through Nashville where he met Jackson, who was in between runs for president, and Lafayette had his watch lifted in Nashville. <laughs> had his what? Watch stolen. Oh, his watch stolen. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the, you're the Nashville guy. You should know. All right. Um, okay, cool. Okay. This is actually the historical marker. Lafayette. They returned it. Lafayette Township Grant. This marker is on the western boundary line of the, of the land selected by the Major General Marquis de Lafayette and granted to him by the United States Congress uh, to him in 1825 in appreciation of, the, of his service during the American Revolution. Okay, um, I'm convinced, and I don't have anything to prove this, but I, I, circumstantial evidence leads me to believe that Duval was behind the fact that this is where the grant would be. Because Duval, there is he did know he, uh, Duval's father did know uh, Lafayette. They were they were they knew each other, and that I th I think that Governor Duval was instrumental in having that piece of land here. Yes. Was, was there any relationship between Marat and Lafayette? <clears throat> I've never really, um, besides the fact that they are French, I've never really seen any real connection. No, not really. Um, and you know Lafayette's role in the French Revolution and the Napoleonic period is, is quite interesting. And I don't know all the details, but it's it's interesting to to, to uh, he almost lost his head a couple of times, I think, in the coming and going of the various revolutions. But so anyway, this uh, Lafayette, the the land grant, very much instrumental in the development of Tallahassee. Okay, this is a scene of the first. This is kind of a romantic version or view of the first uh, capital meeting. This is far different than what's going on today at Webtown. I'm sure. <laughs> Um, I don't see any lobbyists in, in there. <laughs> okay, um, uh, a lot of people will know who this is. This is another Frenchman, exactly. This is the Marquis de La, um, this is um, Akil Murat, and this is actually from a painting. And um, I like this picture because it really kind of shows Murat's, um, he's got that, you know, that, that troublesome smile, that evil looking little smile there. Um, you can you can just kind of read his mind, but anyway, there he is. And again, I want to mention that that he met Duval right after Duval became judge and also his, his appointment of governor. He came to St. Augustine in 1823, really early. He came to St. Augustine before Tallahassee was even founded, and Duval convinced him to come over here. And Duval and they they were really good friends, and they were. 
they do often convince them to come over here. So he's one of the very big, earliest settlers of this area and took advantage of this very fertile land to develop his plantations in Jefferson County. <clears throat> okay, here's New Malta again now. The reason I have him here is because this of this huge confrontation that that Duval and he had regarding the, the Indians here in this area. And this was a very, very desirable area. And Neomalta led Indians that had actually been defeated by Jackson about a decade earlier and had been run into Florida as they come here as refugees. So they've got, they've got an attitude. And he's their leader. He's this very, very towering, uh, powerful, uh, forceful leader. And he was something like six foot two or six foot three. And Duval's about like, you know, not even as tall as me. And they were at odds. And even though he was a signator to the to the Moultrie Creek talks, um, and which which agreed to, to leave, there was a talk about him going back to Alabama. Uh, there was talk of him going over to Quin the Quincy Gadsden County area, but that wasn't good enough. He had to leave. So this was a very, very uh, crucial confrontation that they had. But Duval somehow got the better of it. We don't really know exactly how it worked. And the, the uh, Washington Irving depiction, from what I've been able to tell, is really not that far off. Duval just by force of will and basically sheer lunacy, <laughs> basically went up to the guy and basically said, you gotta get out of here. And you, furthermore, you are no longer head of the, your, your people. I'm going to put somebody else in charge. And that's what he basically did. And he got away with it. So, so anyway, we'll never know. This is the man that Duval uh, replaced Neomalta with. This is Tuco Samalta, who was a, another chief who was far more diplomatic and amenable. And he was the one who eventually took charge of things. And in what I call the first removal, the first removal in 1824, 1825, 1825, I guess, he took his people all uh, out of here and took them down to the new reservation by boat, by paddling, by canoes from St. Mark's <coughs> down to Tampa Bay, and then, or even even further up, maybe Cedar Key, and then and then over to the new reservation. So by that time, there would only be a very, very few Native Americans still in the upper panhandle along the Apalachicola River, um, which, which had a special dispensation to be there because of agreements with Andrew Jackson, which, which gets really complicated. Joe Kanish can explain all that to you. <laughs> we can finish, but it's very complicated. <coughs> now this is, the man that appointed William Pope Duval governor again in 1824, after he was elected in a, in a controversial election, even though Duval had run against him or campaigned against him in favor of Andrew Jackson, this is, of course, John Quincy Adams, yes. and who ran for president in 1824. Who else ran for president in 1824? Jackson. Jackson, exactly. But also Henry Clay ran, Calhoun. William H. Crawford ran, John C. Calhoun ran. And of course, it, it, it all came down to the House of Representatives. And Jackson had the most popular votes. And Jackson had a slight superiority in electoral votes, but he didn't have a majority. So it had to go to the House of Representatives. So we have this happen. Henry Clay, Speaker of the House, who hated Jackson, and Jackson hated him. Of course, we all know the great quote Jackson always said, if I had one, two things to do over, over my life, I would have hanged Henry Clay, and I, or I would have shot Henry Clay, and I would have hanged John C. Calhoun. <laughs> anyway, this is half of, the, half of that quote right here. Here he is. And this, of course, is the, uh, this is a campaign um, slide uh, against Jackson by the, by the, by the um, Adams people. And we all know what happened. Adams eventually appointed Henry Clay Secretary of State, and we have the corrupt bargain. bargain. Yeah. The corrupt bargain, which according to John Randolph of Roanoke, 
the black, uh, the corrupt bargain between the black leg clay and the Puritan, the Puritan Adams stinks and shines like rotten mackerel in the moonlight. <laughs> and I can tell you that nothing stinks and shines like rotten mackerel in the moonlight. Anyway, so that really did it. But not long after that, even though, even though uh, uh, Duval left Florida and campaigned for Jackson like crazy in Tennessee and Kentucky and moved all these anti-clay people in favor of Jackson in Kentucky, um, campaigned like, he, like the devil to try to get uh, Jackson elected. Even with all of that, Adams reappointed Duval governor. And what did Duval do? He continues, like all the other Jackson supporters, to continue to campaign for Jackson in 1825, 1826, 1827, and then of course finally, uh, America is redeemed. Andrew Jackson is elected president, right? There he is as president. Uh, not the, not, the, not the, uh, the wild old hickory that we think of, but of course the old man who was really old. We forget how old he was, and he was sick, and he was, he was, he was in mourning. What happened between the election in 1828 and his actual inauguration in November to, to March of the next year? Rachel died, and he held all of, all of the Adams people um, responsible for that. It was their fault. They had killed Rachel. They'd hashed up all these crazy you know, stories about her, et cetera. Anyway, so he's a weak man. He's, he's over 65 years old when people don't live. Well, he's not, he's not that old, but he's, people don't live that long back then. But this guy could survive by anger and hate. Forget, forget food, he didn't need food. All he needed was anger and hate, and that could keep him alive, and it did. He was, wound, he was, he, he was carrying a bullet wound, a bullet from a duel. He'd had chronic uh, tuberculosis. He, he was a physical wreck, um, and he was never even going to live out his first term. Um, and that's why everybody's thinking that his vice president is going to be president. And his vice president is who? Van Buren. Not yet. John C. Calhoun. Not John C. Calhoun, right. So John C. Calhoun, now think about this from, from, from Duval's perspective. Jackson is finally elected. My mentor, John C. Calhoun, who's in pretty good terms with Jackson at this point, is, is going to be president. We all know it. If not this term, he'll never run for a second term, right? So Duval's thinking, man, Senator Duval in the new state government, a Supreme Court Justice Duval, um, Secretary of, of State Duval, um, President Duval. <laughs> so anyway, you can just imagine what's going through. There he is. There's the character himself. And of course, the ebullient kind of storyteller, tall tale teller. I have some quotes here, but we're getting kind of time, time's, time's moving along. I've got some great quotes of his anecdotes, and of course, people who saw him um, and, and, and basically wrote about how boisterous he was, how much of a great singer he was, tall tale teller, jokester. Um, he could wrap people around his fingers when it came to a jury trial. He was just magnificent as an orator. Uh, um, not a great legal scholar, but a, a, but a great, a great uh, orator. What year was that? Uh, you know, um, my guess is as good as yours. What yeah, do you, what it's, you, it's, it's, yes, but we don't, that's a copy of a copy. <laughs> He's, he's about really four young, years old there. Would you say he's about really four years old? He's, really he's probably, yeah. you know, we found another image of him just, just a few days ago. They're both copied from another image. I'm going to say he's about, <coughs> about 1830, and he's probably just in his four, about four, Yeah, he's probably four, in his 40s. Yeah. I like this picture, I think, better than the other one of my favorites of all. Okay. Okay, here's his friend and collaborator. They're very close, even though. Duval never really, well, this guy was smart when it came to making money. You're going to go to his house this afternoon, you're going to see, man, this guy had it together when it comes to making money and getting rich. This is Richard Keith Call, who was Andrew Jackson's protege, uh, I guess it's fair to say. They broke with one another later on in life. But he was, uh, he became collector of the public monies in, in Tallahassee, a federal position. He also was territorial governor a couple of different times. 
And so he is a very, very successful, he's a railroad builder, he's in the cusp of railroad building. He's very, very successful. He has a very large plantation and lots of <coughs> slaves out in this direction of town. Um, and he was very successful. Richard T. Call. This is a picture of what Tallahassee might have looked like uh, in the 1830s or 40s. This is actually um, drawings from another Frenchman by the name of Castle now, who visited this territory in the 1830s. And this is a, um, uh, a good map of Florida in the 1830s. This is Duval, Florida, I guess, as governor. And you can see the road, partial the road from St. Augustine to Tallahassee. And Duval would have ridden that road and, of course, have ridden, ridden his horses. One of his major um, enterprises was he was ex officio, um, ex officio leader of Indian affairs as governor. It was, his, it was his job to oversee the negotiations with the Indians. And there are many, many um, instances and accounts of the Indians getting, getting really bad land, not adequate land for them. And he was very determined to investigate those claims and so he, in 1826, rode uh, horses and traveled throughout this entire area and made reports back to Washington. And he got in trouble with Gadsden because he claimed the Indians were, were not adequately provided for in terms of the land. The land was not adequate. And they needed to change the boundaries, et cetera. And um, so I have a lot of that in the book. And I, I really came to the conclusion that, that Duval really was, was quite um, was quite uh, determined to see that the Indians got a, a fair shake. And I, again, my, my time is limited, so I don't really have a, a lot of way to, to prove that here, but, but it's in the book, trust me. Okay. Now I have this because this is actually a bank note. This is the Florida Union Bank of Florida, a bank note, which was signed by John Gamble, who was a very famous family from Virginia, from Richmond. They were very well-to-do, and they were the leaders of the banking activities here in Florida. And Duval, as governor, was always skeptical and ambivalent about banks. He hated, of course, the national banks, and he was very much in tune with Jackson on that. But when it came to state banks, he was a little less opposed. But he still was extremely concerned about wildcat banking, which was going on throughout the South at this time, Tennessee, Georgia, you name it. And of course, the territory of Florida wanted to get on board too. They thought this was the only way that the community could develop. And the idea was to mortgage your land and your slaves and to borrow money from the bank, get bank uh, uh, bonds, and then you could use this, this currency theoretically for, for transactions. Well, we all know without regulations what oftentimes happens. You got corruption. Uh, no, no, uh, everybody started saying, well, this property is worth you know, whatever, oh yeah, sure, okay. Just uh, it's not worth anything like what you say it is. And for, for pretty soon, what we have is a huge bust. The la one of the last things that Duval did, after vetoing in his 12 years of office, after vetoing at least half a dozen bank bills, the very last thing he did before he left office in 1834 was to sign into law <laughs> the territorial banking system which three or four years later, when it went up, went up in smoke, of course, he's held accountable. So this is actually a um, official document that Duval signed. Uh, this is actually, one of the things that had to happen was he was for there to be appraisers, official appraisers that would appraise the, the various banks. And he actually appointed this gentleman as appraiser uh, of the bank. <coughs> this is an early view of, of, of Washington. And again, during his time as territorial governor, he's going back and forth to Washington all the time. He's got to bring his accounts. He's got to have his account certified. Uh, a lot of his expenditures were, were basically just uh, written down. And he's, he's, he's having to go, to go to the government to, to continually, um, to continually get, get, get that stuff straightened out. You get another view. I, I really like this view of Washington. This is probably about 1834. This is actually Duval's successor. This is John Eaton. How many of y'all have heard of the Peggy Eaton affair? You probably all know about the Peggy Eaton affair. This is what really did Duval in. Um, it's, very, it's a very complicated story. It involves petticoat politics. It involves women, the salacious women, and notorious women. Um, and even hints of adultery, et cetera, all kinds of cool stuff. 
Um, but the bottom line is, is that it created a political scandal in Washington uh, among uh, 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 Jeff, uh, uh, Jackson's Secretary of War, John Eaton, and his wife, who was of dubious character. Okay. Um, and the cabinet took sides. Yes, Larry. It, didn't it also almost do in Calhoun? It did. Oh, it did him in. Miss and not almost. It did. Miss Calhoun, because Calhoun would respect took the opposite Texas. side of, yeah. of Jackson. Right. Uh, particularly because of his wife, Flora. Flora. She hated Peggy Eaton. Um, and of course, Jackson, of course, kept saying, can't you control your wife? Can't you control right. your wife? Yeah. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the cabinet lined up pro and con, Peggy, right? And so guess who has to get out of Washington fast? Uh, <coughs> um, that's John Eaton. And guess where, guess where they basically sent him? They sent him here, because Duval was, had basically by that time had enough. So 1834, Eaton comes down here. Um, and then Duval, like all ex-governors, decides to, well, he's got to get out of here. You know, he can't be ex-governor hanging around Tallahassee. So he goes back to Kentucky. He tries to reconnect to his old friends and associates in Bardstown and Louisville. And he puts out his shingle, his law shingle for a while, but it never works. And about that time, two dramatic events occur. One is because of Eaton, I think Eaton's unknowledge and negligence of the situation here in Florida. The second Seminole War breaks out. All hell breaks loose. Uh, once Duval leaves the governor chair, I'm convinced that there was no adequate leadership that the Seminoles trusted. I can't say that it was not inevitable for the war to occur, but I, but I think it's a large part because he was not here. But anyway, Eaton was absolutely unprepared for this huge explosion. And then another thing happened. Uh, the revolution in Texas. Simultaneously came the independence movement in Texas against Mexico. And so Duval, when in Kentucky and his sons were up there as well, they jumped onto this Texas revolution. His sons, his two of his sons, Burr and also John Crittenden went down there and his, his, the, his, his great pride and joy son, Burr, his oldest son, was killed at the Battle of Goliad. Goliad was the precursor to the Alamo. Okay. Um, all these guys are rounded up, captured, rounded up, and just basically kept uh, for a day or a day and a half. And then on the third day or the second day, the Mexicans surrounded them and just shot them all like fish in a bowl. The only one of the only survivors of that massacre was Duval's younger son, John Crittenden. But somehow it's one of those bridge over the river Kwai deals. I mean, he, he jumps into the river, he swims, you know, five miles, and all the shooting, of course, he gets away. Somehow he gets away in the middle of, of Texas, and he gets back to Bardstown. He makes it back. And he's, I think he's traumatized by that event his entire life. Uh, his brother's killed, all the rest of the, the Kentuckians are killed. And so he, he just kind of drifts the rest of his life. He's kind of going back. And, um, but he basically pulls himself together and has an incredibly lively and interesting life and becomes the first man of Texas letters. It's called Tell, it's kind of like his father was. Okay, you got here. So, but Duval comes back to Florida after that catastrophe. And this is Washington Irving in later years. <coughs> and about that time, 1840, Irving puts all of these stories, all of these stories into print that he had gotten from Duval. And they turn out at first in Knickerbocker Magazine, which was a magazine, uh, a very popular magazine in New York. Uh, it was a literary magazine. And Irving was really kind of one of the proprietors of the magazine. And so these stories began coming out in the magazine. The, the tall tales of Ralph, the Ralph Ringwood tales. The story of Nehemalpha and, and the governor, you know, and, and all these other stories. And so these stories begin to kind of seep into the American literary psyche, if there's such a thing. Okay. Now, uh, Duval was really kind of at cross, cross, per, cross ends. His wife died in 1841, right here in the yellow fever epidemic. It really, it really hurt him really bad. He was in Washington when she died. She was sick when he left. And she didn't about leaving, but she died. 
And so he decided to pull up and just leave, leave Florida altogether. Or rather, I'm sorry, um, leave Tallahassee altogether. And John Tyler, the new president, appoints him to a federal position in, in St. Augustine. So he goes to St. Augustine for a little while. Okay, this is actually an early picture of you of St. Augustine. And he's living there in the 1840s. This is actually a very early picture of the State House in Austin. <coughs> uh, after Duval does the uh, La Lage uh, part for a while, he comes back to Tallahassee, and he's really, really at, at, at cross ends, at loose ends. He runs for Congress in 1848, and he loses. And he decides just to go to Texas. By this time, his son um, and his other, he's got a third son, his other son is in Texas, and John Crittenden is also in Texas, and, he, and his daughters have moved to Texas. So he decides to basically, after he loses the election of 1848, he, in no certain terms, says, well, <clears throat> I'm going to Texas, and the people of Florida can go to hell. Um, so he basically goes to Texas. And, um, and there he will be for a while, but then he, he ends up moving to, to, uh, to Washington, D.C., where he, where he lives as a kind of a lobbyist. Uh, he actually practiced law up there. He presented cases before Congress, and one of his clients was actually Sam Houston. <coughs> so he died as an old man, actually, in, uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, at the age of 70. <coughs> and if you go here, here's, here's his old mentor, his old mentor, particularly after Calhoun died, about 1850. Cal uh, Duval really began to, to kind of go down as well. Now this is the Calhoun that we think of when we think of the, the debates in 1850 and of course the angry secessionist individual and the, really the patron saint, the patron saint of secessionism a decade later for uh, the disenchanted South. <clears throat> this is the capital that Duval would have seen as an old man in the 1850s. You can see it's a lot different. <clears throat> this is uh, Duval's the last Duval picture we have of Duval. What do you think, Joseph? Can you think this is my portrait? I think this is from an ivory miniature. Yeah. And I think it might not be too much distance from that other picture of it. Really? Yeah. He looks a lot older you, there. You, he looks older. Mm -hmm. But his coat, the way it rides way up in the back and the large lapels is something you see mm -hmm. in the 1830s. Okay. So I'm still thinking it's probably pre photography period, ivory miniature period. Okay. And uh, probably the last picture though he had made. Okay. And we well and we yeah we found later pictures that are just copies of earlier ones. Okay. Now this is what my wife will remember. Uh, my wife who has been with me for 23 years. This is Patty. I did. Um, oh, I'm talking about 30 years of this book. Um, I did not. I did not introduce Patty, did I? No. Well, there I was. I'm introducing all these guys. And I don't introduce Patty. This is my wife, Patty, and she has <laughs> And um, she has been with me through all my trials and tribulations in going to Austin, to, to San Antonio, to Frankfort, Kentucky, to Lexington, Kentucky, um, where, uh, Washington, and of course here. This is the picture that she took, because I, I'm, I never could have taken this. Anyway, and this is Duval's obelisk grave in Washington. It's in the Congressional Cemetery. And it's very interesting when I got there. One of the first things I noticed was not only that we found it right away. It's really lucky. Big cemetery. Um, is not far from there, there's a, um, a marker for Samuel Southard. <clears throat> One of the great finds that I was able to find when I was doing research on the book was the Samuel Southard papers at Princeton. And they were so wonderful. I saw where there were like 34 letters from Duval in this collection of thousands of boxes. Samuel Southard was, was a senator from New Jersey and also secretary of the Navy. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Very thoughtful of you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and they were very, very close. In fact, they were both speculating on the 
on the um, uh, the Lafayette lands, <laughs> as Joe knows. And there were lots and lots of there was lots and lots of uh, letters going back and forth between Duval and Washington with Southard about um, about uh, uh, the Lafayette grant and how they were both going to you know get the land and Duval was going to plant and Duval was going to make them both all kinds of money. Duval was a disaster when it came to making money. He he. Uh, <laughs> He lost money. He spent his own money most of the time. He had to pay, pay people to take care of the Indians, and, and he, he was a disaster. Um, in fact, he got he got um, he was brought up on charges of malfeasance in the Senate, um, Senate, and the Senate actually interrogated him for like two weeks on charges of malfeasance because he had lots of enemies here in Tallahassee who charged him with with stealing money, embezzlement, all kinds of stuff, and of course. <clears throat> the Indian Affairs was a was just a disaster. So it turned out he went up there and he was uh, he was he was brought up for malfeasance of uh, having to pay like thirty thirty two thousand dollars or something like that. But after everything was said and done, the government owed him like a hundred thousand dollars. So that's that and, and and I'm not sure he was really ever paid um, because it took a act of Congress to actually appropriate the money. And even though he had a settlement here in the, in the, in the district court, it took an, an act of Congress literally to, to, to get the money. So I, I really don't know. I don't think the family ever got the money. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not reflected. <laughs> so anyway, that's just kind of a solid. But anyway, this, this was taken probably about 10 years ago in the, in the new law. So that's, that's really the, all I have, unless there's some questions. And I, and I know that um, was it, was it, I know this, this tangential sort of, but wasn't the Lafayette offered two cities to choose from two cities? I forgot the other one was. Could be. I don't know the answer. And I, and I had read the same thing that he was lobbied by certain people, Robert Duvall, but I yeah. thought Richard should call too to take uh, take this. There is some there is some correspondence between Duvall and Lafayette, but not a whole lot of detail. <coughs> is there is there any relationship between Duvall and Jacksonville. I mean, did he try no, that's ironic, isn't it? Yeah. Because you remember, you remember when the when the territory was started, they would name these counties for people like Gadsden. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Gadsden and and, and yeah. of course Jackson and that and um, and um, you know Madison, and, you know all right. that. But Duval really, I think Duval might have practiced there as in court in the circuit court there, or the district court or the, cir the circuit court. But other than that, he never lived in Jacksonville ever. He lived in St. Augustine right. for, for an extended period of time, but never Jackson. But it was, it was named for him, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Now, now just, it's just a little bit. Yeah, in, in terms of traveling. And he never went to Key West either. Yeah. Uh, Duval, now, tried to, you know, tried to really make a big connection with, with Key West. But with Key West, there's, you know, there's Duval Street in Key West, there's Southwood Street in Key West. And, and all of that, but he, he traveled so much. What motivated, oh gosh. What motivated him to travel in by wagon or whatever? Yeah, boat? I mean, boats. That was a, boats. A boat. um, of course, this is before the steamboat. You yeah. know, the eighteen twenties and uh, teens and twenties. This is before steamboats. You know, and and for example, just to give you one example, when he first came to, he was appointed federal judge in eighteen twenty two. Instead of sailing from the Chesapeake straight to St. Augustine, he and his his brother-in-law, his younger brother-in-law, went to the mouth of the St. John's, and they decided to paddle in a canoe all the way down to Picolata. Picolata is below, way below Palatka, almost as far down as as, uh, as Lake uh, Lake Monroe. Paddle in a canoe all the way down, and then ride a horse to St. Augustine from Picolata, which is which is about twenty. I mean, that kind of stuff. And then paddling all the way, you know, you paddle up and down the Apalachicola River, you know, constant, all the time. Mike, you know? did, you, did you find anything uh, <clears throat> relative to the uh, Richmond connection between Duval and John and Samuel Parkhead? Good question. Yes. Because um, they, they had a big connection. And, yeah. And I'm going to buy And, you know, the other big connection with Richmond is Work, William Work. Yes. Yeah. In fact, exactly. William Wirt bought Duval's father's house. I discovered that, and was uh, exactly. I got to go to Richmond for about a week in, in, the, in the process of doing this book, and I got a grant from the uh, a grant, and I was able to stay there for about a week, and I really learned a lot about the Richmond stuff with Duval's father mainly. <clears throat> but in there, I learned about the Wirt connection, and also, um, and 
Gamble, of yeah. course, Richmond, and all of them. See, the Richmond crowd were really, and, and, and Park Hills, they were all really um, important for, and Duval was kind of their, was kind of their conduit, you know? In, in, in uh, your research, did you find at any time that the Union Bank operated efficiently? <laughs> well, it was efficient for some people. <laughs> um, I think in the early years it, it worked pretty. I think the thing that did the the, the Union Bank thing was just the whole national scene. Of like the, the panic. panic. It, it, was, yeah. it was wrapped up in that. Yeah. And again, the, the whole issue of faith bond. Now get this. This is a pretty good deal if you think about it for the bankers. They get the legislature to pass a law saying that the faith of the territory is good for these bonds. So in other words, if the bank goes under, the people of the, of the territory of Florida have to pay all the investors, you know, the bondholders in Britain or in Belgium or everywhere else. And Gamble goes up to New York City and also to London and sells all these bonds, right? And so Call, Call was the real ringleader in that, in, in that. And the faith bonds, yeah, these are faith, these are supposedly faith bonds. So when everything goes under, supposedly they'll all the people in Florida are responsible for paying off these bonds. Yeah. And did they pay them off? No. They defaulted. And of course Duval, and, you, and there's all the twists and turns in the book, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about, but Duval was against the bank to begin with, and then when he finally uh, signed on, signed the bill for the bank, he, he kind of was in a little bit, as much as he could be, but then when everything kind of went haywire, um, he is he is uh, kind of on the other side too, to a certain degree. And it's just a mess. It's just an awful, awful mess. Tell us a little bit about uh, Duval, the family man. Ch children? Yeah, great. Uh, and I really anything? had a great time trying to figure all that out. And again, um, um, John Crittenden was great on that because John Crittenden wrote kind of a, a memoir okay. about growing up here in Tallahassee as a kid going to the Cascades, for example, and running through the creeks, you know, and playing Indians and playing Indians and, you know, and all that, and building forts, he and his brothers building forts in the, you know, little, in that Cascade area. Um, but he, he, he had all, he had, he had three boys, but he had um, at least six daughters, and they're all ravishing to me. I just saw the picture of one of them uh, that I'd never seen before, Florida Duval. I think she was the baby of the family. Right? She was, yeah, she, she, she was the baby of the family. She was, she was born, I think, I born think here. She yeah. was, yeah, she right. was. I think she was born here. And um, there's a lot of wonderful little letters that, to basically to Southard, uh, that he wrote intimate, you know, descriptions of the family and what they were doing and how they were operating. And, and of course, um, there's also some. And you can just imagine what it would have been like for his wife Nancy. Okay, she's she's got these nine or so kids. And, and, and can you and imagine what it would have been like? Here are all these people coming in from Richmond and, and, and from Was she a rich, did she Maryland. come from a rich family? She was from a, a very well-to-do family, family, as well-to-do as you could get. From and, Richmond? Uh, no, no, from Barstown. Barstown. <clears throat> I have Barstown. a question for the official Duval family genealogist. Is there a connection between this Duval branch and the actor Robert Duval? No. Robert Duval is a Marine Duval descendant, Marine Duval of Middle Plantation. We wanted to. But he we is wanted a to, We wanted to sign him up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. How many? How many? Secretary. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do usually defer. <laughs> a point of clarification. Uh, Mr. Pfeiffer says Duval. Mm -hmm. I've been corrected before too. Duval. <laughs> you say Duval. Does it matter? No, I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not getting into that. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing I will stand on, though, is the. Is the way that the, the name is uh, is, is, is it written. French? Yeah, yeah. 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 he kept he kept the a space between the D U and the B and a capital B and all. Not only William Pope his father, and I don't know if you ever found this, but I found this one document where William Duval, his father, actually was on this uh, movement to bring rich settlers into Richmond and, and get them started. Get them I mean, yeah, that was so common for people. And, uh, <laughs> And that was one of our, that, was one of that, Lafayette, that was one of Lafayette's dreams too. Yeah. He wanted to bring wi uh, white settlers, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't remember, he wanted to bring settlers over somehow. 
he, he was, he was, in, he was into that. Um, he was into the, the, the early 19th century. Um, that, that ism. I'm not sure what it is. Okay, so it does not matter. Duval or Duval. Duval would Who's be the Duval, Duval would be the more correct pronunciation in French. I'm pretty certain that the family just called him Duval. Yeah. <laughs> you get to the south, you change it. Uh, I've heard, I've heard that. I know I made a lot of mistakes, you guys. It's kind of it's kind well, of. Well, they tried to make a distinction between the two L's kind of and the one L. They were all perspective. Here is here is the family that knows all this stuff I don't know, and then these people know all the stuff I don't know. I know I made all kinds of mistakes. Well, when you get into the country, it's just the O. Football. I've heard that the uh, <laughs> so, uh, site. Yeah, there's a big controversy about that, and, and I, I wrote a little bit about that in an email, um, and that was a tremendous headache for him, because when he built this this house, um, the surveying was not adequate, and he just started, he, nobody was here, no no white people in all our dinner, so he found the best place he could find, the prettiest spot he could find to build a house, and he thought at the time, which was on the other side of the Cascade, at the time, um, he didn't know where the exact boundaries of the territorial capital that was given by Congress for the for the, the land for the capital, and supposedly it's his homestead is a little bit into that, uh, and then his homestead is a little bit into the Lafayette Grant, which is a total headache, um, and his the uncertainty of his, of his title to the to the land, and it and it was used by his enemies. To say, oh, he came in there and took the best spot, and he's encroaching on it, and he's trying to <coughs> take advantage of, you know, all of this. And it went into the courts a long time, and I think he just walked away from it uh, as time went on. And when his wife died, he had he, he was he was in depression, and he didn't want to go back there. And then I think he started this this house. My best think, uh, thinking is is he started this house, which is where FAMU is right now, and I think he probably borrowed money to the hill and got it going. Now are you and saying then, that Duval was at FAMU? Um, and then again, he just walked away from it. Yeah. And I prefer somebody to ask, how did that house get moved? It says in the archives, moved from the... I don't know. I don't know. The now, I, I just don't think that's the original. Oaks, that, I, I just don't think there's any way that's the original. Okay, now Paisley writes that he built, he, he camped, literally camped out for a while in the old fort. And I assume that to be the commandos <laughs> fort. Well, there was, a, there was a ruins of a fort there. Where? Yeah, where, where his house ended up being, I think. But are you talking about over here or are you talking about up in the top of the hill? Uh, at the Cascade, at the, at the Cascade. I think. Cascade. Could, can I go back to that thing about the Duval House being where FAMU is? Because that's what Lee L. Nealon said. He that's said this. Yeah. But by, by the same token, Sally Blake, industrialist yeah. Sal Hessett, says it was owned by George Walker. So did Duval ever own property where FAMU is today? I don't know the answer to that. Walker. I know that he's. I, I know well, that I mean, he's. I know that he started. It's in the. There's a lot in. There's a lot in the book about the second house that he started building, and he had this. He had this. Um, he had his, his daughter married this gentleman, who was a, by all by all, um, accounts was a, you know, going to be great, going to be rich, etc. But he died unexpectedly. Here in Tallahassee. Yeah, and and he when he left, he sold whatever he had in that house. And it, the titles are unclear, and that was the other problem. He did a bond saying, well, if the title is, is, is not held to be valid, I will owe you this kind of, this much money or whatever. It's very confusing. And he just walked away from it and then went to St. Augustine. <clears throat> and then I think he may have reoccupied that house when he came back in the uh, 1848, 1850. So you don't think that building that is identified as the What's it, the Duval House on the hill mm -hmm. is actually, was actually his house? It's not the original one, I'm sure. No, he, he went back to Bargetown completely for a while. Yeah. And when I think when he came back, I mean, he just abandoned that or got rid of it, never went back to it, and built a house which later 
became, there's several pictures of a big two-story antebellum house, which later became part of FMU. The and Walker Estate, next which, door to George K. Walker. Yeah. yeah, and that's, and I don't know if he bought it or started it. That's supposed to be 1891, uh, and that was the sure. Alvin Harper collection of pictures. Yeah, I've, I thought there yeah. should be some authenticity. Yeah, I don't know, I, I, I wouldn't be able to really okay. say anything. So the Walker Duval house was there, was bought by Walker? Uh, Walker already had it. Whichever one lived the longest. I'm 19 think, I'm and nine. I'm sure. She died in Austin, Texas in 1909. 1909, and she was the, the longest. Florida, Florida. I don't long. think anybody lived past her. No. But you know, you hear these in accounts, and his daughters were just the most beautiful um, young girls in this whole place. I mean, people just go crazy over his daughters. And, and, uh, they. Most of them married well, some didn't. Mary Hines Duval lived to 1911. One, one minor correction. Uh, <coughs> you mentioned that the fish in the barrel business for Burr when he was killed. Uh, well, first, the Alamo fell on March the 6th. On April, no, yeah, in late March the 27th on Palm Sunday. Actually, just before that, there was a small battle that they were involved in uh, east of Goliad, mm -hmm. Battle of the Kalitos. Mm -hmm. They surrendered honorably mm -hmm. to a General Rea, mm -hmm. who was probably the best general that the Mexicans had. Santa Ana was not all that good. And he lost uh, about a month later at San Jacinto to prove it. When they surrendered, and the Sons of the Republic of Texas has General Urea's original copy of the surrender document. Much was spoken about the handling of prisoners and so on and so forth. Marched them back to Goliad. They stayed there a few days, as you mentioned. They were told they were going to be repatriated. They were marched out in three columns and murdered. Oh. Murdered. What's Their that? bodies left to rot in the field. Yes. John Crittenden escaped, as a few others did, and they I saved a couple of doctors. Uh, to tend to the wounded, and actually one of them, Shackleford, ended up back in San Antonio to tend to the remaining yeah, wounded. Is, the there, is, there, is, there a, is there a book out on that? Or is, or <laughs> John Crittenden's book, yeah. Early yeah. Times in Texas. Yeah. Okay. John yeah. Crittenden Duval wrote about it many years after the fact. He wrote a lot of things, as you said. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so that was really the timeline mm -hmm. and really the betrayal of a an honorable surrender mm -hmm. to a massacre. Right. <clears throat> No, if anybody would like to get a book, I'm sure Patty would like to sell you one.